Good morning, High Point Church. Such a blessing to worship in the house of the Lord with the saints of the Lord for God's glory and um, being able to magnify his name. In many other places in the world, this is prohibited and even you get killed for doing something like this. And so um, I pray that you don't take this as a, a, for granted, but that you would use the time to, to really be grateful for this opportunity. So um, my name is Junior, for those of you who don't know me. Welcome to those of you who are online and, of course, those of you who are here in person. And um, I'm the assistant pastor here of discipleship, and I have the privilege of speaking to you from God's word. And um, I want to take a moment just to kind of align myself with what I'm going to talk about for a moment, right? So looking in, looking at today's world, it could sometimes feel a little confusing. It could appear as though God has left us to fend for ourselves. Now, on the global stage, we see evil on display in a very brazen way. When an event like the Olympics, which should be used to bring people together to celebrate the many physical abilities of humankind, it is rather used to mock our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the question is, where is God? When a nation like Israel is brought under scrutiny for defending its citizens in a terror attack, pursuing their kidnapped citizens and further going on the offensive to stop a group who has vowed to wipe them off the face of the earth. Question is, where is God? When thousands of Nigerian families and communities that have committed to following Jesus as are constantly being attacked, burned to death, mutilated and killed for their faith. The question one asks is, where is God? Just to bring it home a little more, when a hurricane blazes through our islands and damages and destroys the homes of thousands in our country, again, we wonder the question, where is God? When, ma- when the marriage you've poured your life into is gone. When you can't pay your bills, afford your food or other needs. When you lose your job. Question again becomes where is God? Now, in no uncertain terms, these are all tremendously difficult experiences. And sometimes we are tempted to believe we're on our own that God doesn't care and that whatever we're going through, we can't depend on God. I want to say my brother and my sister, you can depend on God. God is here. He cares. And even when we don't see it, the songwriter says, he is working. As a matter of fact, There's a whole chunk of scriptural teaching on this theme, and that's what we're going to get into today when we talk about this idea of the doctrine of providence. No, I'm not referring to someone's last name. But providence, just to give you a definition, is the continuing and often unseen activity of God in sustaining His universe, providing for the needs of every creature and preparing for the completion of his eternal purposes. Because we're going to be talking about this for um, the length of breath of this message, I want to read it again. Providence is the continuing and often unseen activity of God in sustaining his universe, providing for the needs of every creature and preparing for the completion of his eternal purposes purposes. So providence is how things really get done. 
Therefore, it is really an observed fact that providence could be overlooked. In the Christian community, we tend to be preoccupied with the pursuit of miracles. We want to see the miracles happen. We want instant change and transformation in our lives and in the situations and the lives of those we care about. We can be very enthusiastic about hearing from a person who has titled themselves as prophets. We want a clear glimpse of a positive future outcome. We want to know the destination of our lives, not as it play out, but before it play out. God, give me a little insight. Let me know who or when or what or how much. So because of these inherent desires, providence often takes a backseat. God works in our lives through ordinary means, and sometimes ordinary is just too ordinary. We want the hype. We want the casting out of demons, the raising of the dead, the healing of the sick, the miraculous provision of needs, fire from the skies, and of course, water from the rock. We want an action-packed adventure filled, fun-induced, and abundantly wealthy life. That's our desire. And Note, there is nothing inherently wrong with these desires. But the problem is, oftentimes, these same desires is what the devil uses to get us to distrust, dislike, and disobey God. Listen to James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. It says this, But each person is tempted when he is Lord and enticed by his own desire. It's not by someone else's desire. It's by the desires that are within. That's when temptation comes. Verse 15 says, Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. Sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth. So when you have lived your life professing to be a Christ follower, but live, living, in a total, living in total abandonment to our own desires rather than his, it leads to death. It leads to eternal damnation. So we, we have to be very careful with our desires. Here are some of the effects of what not understanding and affirming the doctrine of providence would look like in a life. So when we don't affirm and understand and, and believe this teaching from God's word, we tend to lack trust in God. Because if God seemingly is not working in the ordinary means of life, anxiety and worry pops up. And we may experience higher levels of anxiety and worry, feeling like life's events are just random and outside of God's control. We become very self-reliant. The tendency to rely more on our self-effort and human wisdom rather than seeing God's guidance and trusting His plan. Our prayer lives become inconsistent. We, we suffer from prayerlessness. If we don't believe in God's active involvement, it, goes to, it tends to say there may be a prayerless life or we may pray less frequently thinking it has little impact on our real life events. We may be offering up superficial prayers. Prayers may be just come rote and something I have to do on a daily basis or on a, a prayer meeting event and it lacks the depth and it lacks the trust and the dependence on on God's providence that it should have. How about this? Difficulty when facing trials. We become filled with despair and lose hope when we face trials and suffering because we feel like God has abandoned us. Like there's no hope for our situation. It can't be turned around. 
you become bitter with God and become angry at God or towards God during difficult times, you question his goodness. So this situation can't be good. How about this ethical and moral ambiguity? We begin to compromise and on biblical principles, making decisions based on convenience or cultural norms rather than seeking God's will. Our worship and gratitude reduced. We lack the recognition of God's providence and therefore we can't thank God for something we don't believe he's working in, right? We become persons who just do superficial worship. Singing to God is just a mere ritual that we have to do on a, on a Sunday or when we're around other Christians, rather than a heartfelt response to God's sovereign grace in our lives and for his provision. Another thing, our zeal for evangelism becomes waned or weakened. Without a strong belief in God's providence, there may be less motivation to share the gospel doubting God's ability to work through evangelism. And so all of these things are what we might call a, a good litmus test as to whether or not this is something we affirm and understand or whether we need to have a deeper understanding of it so as to be the opposite of these things I just listed. Here are some prominent passages of scripture that teach God's providence. And you will identify some of them. Romans 8, 28, a popular one. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. So this verse clearly states that God orchestrates all things for the good of his people. And you know, you, when you hear the term orchestrate, you think of an orchestra. And it sounds so beautiful and delightful. And uh, the violin is at the right place. And the, the different instrument coming at the right time. And there's such harmony and beauty in that. But take away the conductor from the orchestra. And it's chaos. Because nobody knows what to play and when to play and the harmony, and the order is gone. Hebrews 1.3 He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the, the word of his power. This is God's providence. Proverbs 16.9 The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. So we could plan all we want, but except God is in it and he doesn't establish those steps, nothing will take place. Ephesians 1.11 In him, says Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So there we go again. God is working all things. Proverbs 19, 21 is another text. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And of course, our main text for today, Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17, it reads, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you. That at the entrance of your word, light comes. Thank you that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. That it's living and active. And God, it pierces to the division of soul and spirit, of bone and marrow. And it discerns the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. 
grateful that your word is a light unto our path and a lamp to our feet. God, would you give us guidance today as to how we would navigate life with a deeper understanding of your providence, with a deeper understanding of how you're working things together and how our working should be in alignment with yours. God, we pray that we would not just be hearers of your word, but we would be doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you're here and you don't have a Bible or a sermon outline, you can go ahead and raise your hand. And one of our ushers will be able to get one to you so that you could follow along in God's word. There's a group of people in the book of Acts called the Bereans. And they were commended specifically for when Paul came into town and he preached. They didn't just swallow it and go home and just started to do. They were commended that when they went back home, they checked the scriptures to see if everything Paul was preaching was so. And I hope that there are some Bereans here today that would not just be gullibly listening and choosing to act, but that we would be able to take notes and go home and somebody could call me during the week and say, Junior, that thing we said it, that ain't in the Bible. And so that's the kind of audience I pray that you would be today. I want to talk to you from this text and, of course, from the theme on your outline, the preserving providence of the all-powerful God. The preserving providence of the all-powerful God. Here's a summary statement of where I'm going today. This should encapsulate everything. God created and controls everything. Therefore, we must trust and follow his providential care and plan. God created and controls everything. Therefore, we must trust his providential care and plan. So point number one on your outline, write this down. God created everything. Trust his providential care. We see this in verse 16 of our text. It says, for by him, which is Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So there's two things inherent in this, in this text. One is that God created you. Right? That's without guessing here. And then secondly, you were created for God. So not only did he create you, but you were created for him. The Bible teaches that God created us in his image and likeness. Being created in God's image means that he has created us with some characteristics like himself. So you could think of it this way. There is, theologian calls this the communicable and the incommunicable attributes of God. Communicable, of course, mean when you think about communicable disease, something that we share. And incommunicable. So there are characteristics that God has that no human being has. For instance, God is omnipotent. We are not omnipotent. Right? God is immutable, which means he's unchanging. We change all the time. You just grew a second older. He doesn't. And so, when we talk about attributes that we share, we're thinking of things like love. So God is all loving, but also we share some aspects of that attribute when we express love for not only self, but others. God is holy, which means he's totally separate from others. There's an aspect of what we do, uh, who we are, especially as believers, and we're considered to be holy. We separate ourselves from a lifestyle of sin and unrighteousness towards a lifestyle of right actions towards God. God is merciful, but also we can be merciful to others. God is wise. He's all wise, but we are wise um, in some aspects, in some ways as, as well. 
So these traits we share with God, apart from which we would just be animals. We act on instinct. Now, God did not go through all of this trouble. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that it was difficult to create us. But it means that he took time. He did not go through this creation process just as a little experiment. He wasn't like sitting down and like, what should I do today? Let me make a man. And then let me make a woman from his rib. And then let me allow them to procreate and fill up the earth. No, that was not his thought process, right? There is a sense in which while God created us and we have some sense of independence, he created us, as I said before, for a purpose. So you are created for God. That's another thing inherent in verse 16. To say that we are created for God means that we are created in such a way that it brings glory and honor to him. It means that our lives have a specific purpose in relation to Christ. It means we are not autonomous beings and we are not self we don't have self-determined purposes. Instead, our existence finds its truest meaning in serving, worshiping, and being in a relationship with Jesus. It means we were made to reflect his image, live according to his teachings, and participate in his redemptive plan for the entire world. So since all things were made for him, everything ultimately belongs to him. And is under his authority. Understanding that we are created for, for Jesus gives us a clear sense of purpose. Our identity is found in our relationship with Christ. And our lives are meant to align with his will and reflect his character. So if we are created for Jesus, our primary response should be worship and adoration. Everything we do should be done to honor him. So knowing that all creation is for Jesus should provide hope and assurance for us. It reminds us that history is moving toward the fulfillment of Christ's purposes. And as his followers, we are part of that grand design. So you were purposefully fashioned. He formed your spirit, soul, body, your personality, your temperament, your color, your height, thinking patterns, your emotions. You are not a mistake. Sometimes it could be misconstrued that based on our appearance, we might look confident and we know what we're about, but inside there is a bundle of insecurity. And those insecurities sometimes stem from things that happened to us in our past, things that are happening to us now, things that we expect that didn't come, come true. And so it's, it's often helpful to remind ourselves that nothing happened by mistake. God created everything. He created you. He created me. He created us with purpose and design. For his glory and honor to worship him, to adore him. And your existence is not a mistake, it's not an accident. This is often more helpful for persons of a younger age. As growing up, sometimes it's, it's pretty difficult to have a deeper understanding of life and what what I'm created for at a young age because your, your physical features are still being formed, your mind is being formed, you're just understanding life to a great degree. And oftentimes, the identity is, is kind of attached to different things in our lives. Maybe something on social media, a, a music artist, a, a, a movie star, somebody in your community. It might be a parent. But whatever it is, if it's not Jesus... Oftentimes, your identity becomes skewed because you wrap yourself up. If 
your friends is not around, you feel lonely. There's something that they call these days doom scrolling. And this one is for the adults, right? You come home from work, you're tired, you just gave it your all, you get home, you just want to relax. So you pick up the phone and you start to scroll. Choose the social media, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, etc. You started scrolling at 12 and before you look, it's 4. It's night, children dinner in Mech yet. What are you looking for? One of the um, preachers that I admire, he had a statement that he made that really stood out to me. He said, you can tell how much God a person has by how much entertainment they need. So there's a sense in which when our identity is wrapped up in something, we can't just sit still and maybe have a mental conversation with Jesus or just relax and you have to do something or think about something or watch something or listen to something. You feel like I ain't doing nothing with my life if I'm not doing that. And so it, it's piggybacking on that insecurity that might exist there, that there's always a need for something to fill that void. But I want to tell you, once Jesus isn't filling that void, nothing else will. You could doom scroll for the rest of your life if it wouldn't satisfy you. So here's a, a passage of scripture that really stood out to me. I wish I had heard this in my, my early teens, it would have saved me a lot of heartache. Psalm 30, 139, verses 13 to 16. Here's what it says. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So long before your greatest grandparents existed, God had you in mind. He had already tailored your physical suit. He had your emotions outlined, your hairline and your color of your skin and all those details. This is you. And for those of you who probably haven't gone to university yet or haven't put up on the right YouTube channel or the wrong YouTube channel, I want to say this. You're not some random evolutionary piece of love. You were made in the image of God with destiny, purpose, and for the glory of God. And so I want to remind you that if you don't understand what providence is, how God is working in your formation and your um, peculiarities, your temperament, your emotions, how God is using all of these things to be a representation of him on the earth, it's highly likely that you would trust God and you would always be looking for other things to fill that void. So now is the time for you to exhibit hopefulness rather than hopelessness. Now is the time for you to show confidence in God, not doubt. Now is the time for you to double down on your commitment to the Lord and not waver. Don't be blinded by the immediate and instant because the way maker has created you and providentially cares for you. Second point, God controls everything. 
So he creates everything, he created everything, he controls everything, follow his providential plan. Verse 17 tells us, and he is before all things. And this phrase is the summation of the message. In, and in him, all things hold together. I was doing a little experiment yesterday. I was just kind of searching through the internet. I was asking the question, what if, and this, those of you who like science and, and these types of things might, might be interested, what would happen to, to us, our existence? Let's say God were to decrease the speed of the earth on its axis by 100%. Or increase it by 100%. There would be no life. <laughs> Climate would change. It's hard to imagine, but that's something that God can do. He's in control. What would happen if God were to um, increase the amount of gravity that's in the earth. All of a sudden, your easy footstep becomes very hard. One of the ways we know God is in control is because despite the destructive nature of humankind, he is still sustaining us. And make no mistake, humans are destructive. If you think differently, maybe you should, maybe if you started a reading plan, just roll right back to Genesis and just kind of see all of the actions of all of the individuals coming right up to Revelation. From, from creation to the first person to know, God has continually stepped in and saved us from ourselves. As a matter of fact, if you're honest, you of all persons should know what goes through your mind. When somebody upsets you, somebody get a bad drive, somebody get on your nerve. If you had to count what you would do to all of those persons, there may not be any more humans on the earth. Talking about God's control, here are some passages that highlight God's total control. God controls the whole world. Genesis 1-1 reminds us in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It would be totally irrational for the Lord to create everything within existence and not have the power to control it. God controls the affairs of heaven and earth. Deuteronomy 4.39, know therefore and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on, earth be, and on the earth beneath. There is no other. Daniel 4.35, all the inhabitants of the earth are, are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand. Or say to him, what have you done? God controls our ability to get wealth. Deuteronomy 8, 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gave you power to get wealth. Take away your eyesight, your speech, whatever field you're in as a career. Take away your ability to see and touch and feel and all of those things. Your ability to create income or get wealth. It's gone. God is in control. He appoints and deposes earthly rulers. Romans 13.1. This is a good verse to memorize for election. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, 
and those that exist have been instituted by I was reading um, Isaiah um, the other day, passage in Isaiah, and this is one of the things God was saying to the children of Israel. He was calling Nebuchadnezzar, who raided Israel, captured people, took them back to Babylon. He was calling Nebuchadnezzar his servant for doing that. One theologian said, there isn't one maverick molecule in existence. Everything is under God's control. Every follicle of hair, every atom, every nucleus, the smallest of particles is controlled by God. There's nothing out of his control. And, um, and oftentimes... The time when we need to be reminded of this, we are not. Because when life gets difficult and you can't pay the bills, school fee coming up and food for buy and school shut to buy and school pants and you're wondering what's going to happen. University tuition. Loans to pay, mortgage. Oftentimes, when the problem is upon us, it's hard to think about how much in control God is because things feel like it's out of control. And that's why situations like now, where we're getting a glimpse as to how much in control God, God is, needs to be top of mind for us. Because presently, it may not be important for us how much in control God is. But there's going to come a time when it feels chaotic. The second aspect of the point talks about God's providential plan. Now what's that? Ultimately, God's plan culminates with his people worshiping and enjoying him in the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21 verses 1 to 4 gives us a glimpse of this. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away their tears, every tears from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. This is the part of the picture of the glorious time we will be having with Jesus. But in the meantime, God's plan is to prepare us for that future. To save those of you who don't know him as Lord and Savior, and those of us who know him to continue to make us more like Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not a prophet, but based on the truth of God's word, I can guarantee you joy, peace, hope, fulfillment, purpose, meaning, confidence, and assurance. Once you pay attention to how your creator God is providentially caring for you, and once you acknowledge and give total allegiance and follow the plan that he has provided for you, all of these things. So, one of the main reasons I chose to speak from this topic this morning is that 
of course, we had a hurricane that passed, and there are different things that are going on in the life of persons. But I really truly sense that persons are experiencing a difficult time. It feels real chaotic and problematic, like God is not really in control. What's going on here? And so this message is for those of you who may be going through a difficult time right now. This difficult time could be interpreted as your opportunity to realign and refocus your eyes back on Him. You may be going through a dry season in your walk with the Lord. You've lost your bearings and wrong things feel like right things. God wants you to know that he could make all things new. And so, of course, we're talking about providence and God working things up, but understanding and affirming this begins with starting in a a relationship with him. And I don't ever want to take it for granted that there's, that everyone here is a believer, that everyone who is listening online is a, is a Christian. Affirming and understanding this plan begins with that relationship with Christ. So if you're here and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're here and you know for certain that if you die today, you will not spend eternity with God. I want to pray for you. I want to ask the Lord to change your heart so that you would see your sin and that you would see his goodness and that you would turn to him 